Hopefully you've opened up to the New Testament book, the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 6. We've been working our way through Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus on Sunday morning. And uh, um, just um, by way of reminder, we've mentioned that, that Paul spends three years in Ephesus. It's a completely pagan town. And spending three years there, he establishes the church. Then after three years, he goes away. Five years later, he writes back this this letter that we know as Ephesians, uh, the letter to the church of Ephesus. And we've been traveling through that uh, on Sunday morning over the last several months. And so we've covered a number of topics. We just finished the last two weeks. Paul talked on Christian marriage and how Christian marriage is different than marriage in our world. And uh, so that was the end of chapter five. And now we come to chapter six, Ephesians chapter six. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip over this week the first nine verses, and we're going to pick it up in verse 10. We'll come back to the first nine verses in a few weeks. But today we're going to turn our attention to the subject of spiritual warfare. Commonly, that, that's how it's called. And the reason for that is just all the things that we see going on in our world, the, the challenges that, that we're hearing in marriages and family and children and and those who are struggling with things like substance abuse and things of that nature. So I thought it would be good if we, we took a few weeks and we looked at this, and then we'll come back and we'll pick up the first few verses. Now, as we get into this, as you've heard me say so many times before, that the big question is always, what do you leave in and what do you leave out? Because this is a very big subject. People write books on this, so I'm just gonna, we're gonna take a couple of weeks to talk about this and uh, so, so this is just going to be just by way of introduction. But if you want to go further in this, and I hope that you do, one of the best resources that I've ever found, and I've read a number of books on the subject of spiritual warfare, is this book called The Invisible War, and it's by Chip Ingram. It's a fantastic book. And if you ever want to lead a small group, uh, on this would be a fantastic small group. And the good news is you don't have to be an expert in spiritual warfare in order to lead the group. You can kind of learn as you grow or as you facilitate. Now, the only thing I have against this book, The Invisible War, and I don't even know if I should bring it up, but, but it, he calls his book The Invisible War, and there in the top of your outline, you'll notice that we've called this teaching The Unseen War. So it appears that what he's done is he's tried to rip off my title, <laughs> and, and, but other than that, it's a really good book. So it's, uh, he tried to get very close, but, but I'm on to him. So, so there you have it. But we're going to give him a pass. <laughs> Some of you are like, really? No. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to pick it up in verse 10. We're going to cover the first few verses. Now, when we do that, um, we'll go through the first few verses today. The next week, we'll come back. We'll go through the same verses, but then we'll begin to unpack as we go. So this is, again, by way of introduction. So verse 10, he begins by saying, finally, and this is going to be the final teaching in this book. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We'll begin talking about that next week. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And you want to highlight the emphasis in these passages on the word stand. And that'll be important this week and, and next week. Verse 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, uh, the conclusion here, or what we do with that, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist, my Bible says resist, how many of your Bibles say withstand, withstand? That's actually a better translation, withstand. We'll talk about that as we go. In the evil day, and having done everything to stand firm, verse 14, stand firm, stand firm. So we'll see the emphasis there on standing. The starting place will be verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And we'll talk about how do we become strong in the Lord in our coming teachings, not so much today, but maybe just a little bit. So the first thing I wanna say, verse 11, it says, but put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So the first thing I want you to write down is that Satan is real. 
Satan is real. Uh, in Revelation, it says it like this, all the ways that you can describe Satan. It says, he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. So however you want to term him, it's all him. It's all him. So when I say Satan is real, some of you would say, okay, so what's the big deal about that? Well, very interesting, uh, going to Barna Research. And so what I'm going to share with you, Barna Research, they, 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 poll Christians mostly in what's happening in church world. And uh, that, that's how they do their research. This research is a little bit dated. So what I'm going to share today is going to be bad, but because it's dated, it means it's even worse now than it was a few years ago when they did this. So the title of the article is this. Most American Christians do not believe that Satan or the Holy Spirit exist. Goes on to say, Four out of 10 Christians, 40%, strongly agreed that Satan is not a living being, but is a symbol of evil. An additional two out of 10 Christians said they agree somewhat with that perspective. So about 60% of people who profess to be Christians either do not believe that Satan is actually an entity. Um, he's more of an illustration, a metaphor. So that's, that's kind of how, how they would, would hold him. So about 60% hold that he's, they're not really sure that he even exists. Now, very interesting, it goes on. Much like their perception of Satan, most Christians do not believe that the Holy Spirit is a living force either. Overall, 38% strongly agreed and 20% agreed somewhat, and this is 58%, that the Holy Spirit is a symbol of God's power or presence, but is not a living entity. Now, what that means is that about 60% of people who profess to be Christians don't believe that the Holy Spirit is the second person or the third person in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but it's more like Star Wars where you have the force. So it's just more of a, 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 a symbol. And so Satan is more like a metaphor, some, something like that. Now, I found this very interesting. So the influence of faith, it goes on to say, most self-described Christians contend that their religious faith has significantly impacted their life. Almost six out of 10 adults, 59%, said that their faith had greatly transformed their life, which I find very interesting. 60% uh, say that their faith has greatly trans transformed their life. They just don't believe anything that their faith actually teaches, that, that, that the Bible says. So I find that interesting. So today, what we're going to do as we get into this, we're going to talk about great, uh, Satan's greatest tool, and his greatest tool is deception. So we'll talk about that as we go. So even though the Bible speaks about the devil, the dragon, Satan, from cover to cover, Satan wants us to believe that he isn't really real, um, just more of a metaphor, well, just so you know, Paul the Apostle believed that, that Satan was real. He, he writes about that. Jesus believed that Satan was real. But many people believe that Satan is just a metaphor for evil. Just so we understand that when Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, he was not tempted by a metaphor. He was tempted by a very real Satan. And he believed in demons so much uh, that there's not a single time in your Bible where Jesus stops and says, come out of that person, thou foul metaphor of evil. He never says that. He always speaks to the demon as though they're real. Sometimes those demons spoke back. Metaphors do not speak back, but, but demons do. Um, so biblically speaking, it's not is Satan real or not, it's what do we do with him. My uh, son Daniel went to a local Christian college and he was in a theology class and the professor said that back in Jesus's day, they cast out demons, but it wasn't really demons because it was more psychological conditions because they didn't understand psychological conditions. So Jesus did that so that they would understand, but it was really psychological conditions, not really demons. I thought that was so interesting because when Jesus cast the psychological condition out of the one that was known as legion, that psychological condition went out of legion and went into a herd of pigs. I had no idea that psychological conditions could go out of one person and go into something else, but you learn something every day. So 
So verse 12, so Satan is real, verse 12, it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So you wanna write down, I'm in a real war. I'm in a very real war. The war is in the spiritual realm, and uh, that's why it talks about spiritual forces. That's what we are battling. So in order to engage in this war, we're gonna have to see the real enemy for who the real enemy is. Satan, who does not want us to believe that he exists, wants us to also believe that the real enemy is your spouse, your siblings, your boss, your coworkers, anything but what's happening in the spiritual realm. He'd rather us fight them than what's taking place in the spiritual realm. And he realizes that if we fight them, not recognizing the real war, um, we're gonna be completely ineffective because battling the spirit with our flesh never works. Does that make sense? Well, going on. So I'm in a real war, so I don't have to consider if I want to be in this war the reality is I am in this world. When you became a Christian, you were born again. You were born into a spiritual war. And so the question isn't, do you want to be in the war? The question is, are you winning the war or is this war overtaking you? Notice this verse there in your outline from uh, 1 John. It says that we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So not only are we in a war, but we also find that we are in enemy territory. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Have you ever heard somebody say something like, well, I know if it's God's will, it's just gonna happen. Well, that's not true because right now the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We're in enemy territory. When you study Satan's kingdom, what you'll find is that there are fallen angels there are demons, and those demons are in hierarchy, are in different hierarchies. And uh, one of the things that you study and you find out that angels, fallen angels, are not demons. They're very different. Fallen angels never seek to possess a body. Demons always seek to possess a body. They're very different. And uh, when we come back after Easter, we're gonna take four weeks to talk about uh, Bible prophecy in times, and we're gonna unpack that. What does that mean? But we're also going to have L.A. Marzulli come in and share two weeks after Easter, and he's gonna unpack all of that for us. So if this is new to you, you wanna be here. It's an absolutely fascinating study. So the good news is, and you wanna write this down, is that we fight from victory. We fight from victory. Now we're in chapter six, but all the way back in chapter one, Paul said this about our, our victory and his power in our life. It says, and his incomparably great power for us who believe, that power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power, dominion, and every title that can be given only in the present age, also, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. So that power is available for us now. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church. So the idea is the power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that's available to you and, and I. So when, when we think about spiritual warfare, uh, you, you want to think about spiritual warfare like what God has provided for his children and what Satan has. So um, for those of you who are in the military, I was in the army, I was uh, airborne infantry. And so when, when I was in, just shortly after the Civil War, it seems, but, but, but when you, you go in, you, you always have a helmet, you have body armor, and uh, you had weapons back in those days. It was the M16 with the 203 grenade launcher, the M60 and things like that. And uh, you had a radio that you could call in an airstrike. You could call in artillery and, and, and things, things like that. So the, in, in our military, we were well armored, we were well supported, and we were well trained so that we could engage our enemy. Now, 
Satan, on the other hand, when you think of him, you need to think of him as an enemy who has nothing more than sticks and stones. That's really all he has. And so if you're in the military and you're well-trained, you're well-armed and you're well-prepared, he's no match for you. But if you go out on patrol and you go alone and you don't take your armor and you don't take your weapon, you decide to go on patrol with just your shorts and a t-shirt and you encounter him, even though he only has sticks and stones, he's still going to win because we're not prepared. Does that make sense? So the idea is we've been given so much more and uh, we're much more well-equipped but we have to use what it is that we've been given. So the good news in verse 10 is finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So we'll talk about that more beginning next week. Our strength, our power is gonna be in the strength of his might, not in our ability or our strength. So we'll talk about that as we go. So then the question is, what can Satan do? And I wanna give just a couple of, of quick illustrations. So write this down. Spiritual forces can affect the material world, the material world. You will remember the story in Jesus's ministry. He goes to the synagogue in Luke's gospel and it says there was a woman who for 18 years who had a sickness and then you want to underline caused by a spirit and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your sickness, sickness. So something had taken place in the spiritual realm. The manifestation was a sickness in this woman that caused her to be doubled over. I would suggest that in this case, if the sickness had a spiritual uh, beginning, a spiritual root, then no medical help could, could help that. It had to be dealt with spiritually. So I do need to say that there's two extremes in church world, and the two extremes are this. First of all, uh, some people think that every time somebody's sick that it's, it's demonic. I would not hold that. And then the other side of the church holds that there is no such thing as demons. If you're just sick, you're just sick. It has nothing to do. And I wouldn't hold that. So there has to be some discernment there. And, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk about that as we go. So then the next thing I, I wanna highlight, the next little story there, how, how does Satan influence, uh, how does his, how does his uh, influence in somebody's life manifest in their life. And so there's this great story. It's told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's the story of the one that we know as Legion, who had many demons in him. And it says this. You want to underline a couple of things as we go. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from, from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes. You want to underline that? Or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs, tombs, uh, crying out, Mark's gospel adds, crying out and cutting himself, cutting himself. Something was taking place in the spiritual realm and it was manifesting in this man's life. And so, so we see three manifestations here. First of all, um, we see that there is an inappropriate nudity. He had not worn clothes. And so he felt very comfortable going with, with no clothing on. And uh, in this case, it's demonically induced. The second thing that we notice is that he lived among the tombs. And so we would say that he had a fascination for death. There was a fascination for death. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen this, but when we, we go to buy our kids clothes, it just seems like all the clothing out there uh, has skulls all over. It's like a big theme in our society, skulls everywhere. Now, always keep in mind that Jesus came that we might have life, but Satan comes to kill, rob, and to des destroy. And so his fascination is always going to be on death, but Jesus' fascination and those who follow him is always going to be on life. So I just notice, and we live in a generation where the emphasis seems to be on skulls and, and death. Very interesting. But then it says he was crying out and cutting himself, cutting himself. Now, I found this interesting. This is an article from the New York Times, comes from last November. 
And it says, uh, getting a handle on self-harm, cutting and other forms of self-injury are on the rise among adolescents. Researchers are beginning to understand the phenomenon and how to treat it. Well, then it goes on and it tells a story of somebody who uh, had been cutting themselves and, it, and it's uh, herself. And she says, I had this popsicle stick and I carved it into a sharp point and scratched myself, Joan, a high school student in New York City said recently, I'm not even sure where the idea came from. I just knew it was something that people did. I remember crying a lot and thinking, why did I just do that? I was kind of scared of myself. Why did I do that? Well, then the article goes on and it says, self-injury, particularly among adolescent girls, has become so prevalent so quickly that scientists and therapists are struggling to catch up. About one in five adolescents report having harmed themselves to soothe emotional pain at least once. Now, I, I find that interesting. Here's what I would say. We see that this man was cutting himself. In that case, it was demonically induced. And I would say that if somebody is doing that and it's demonically induced, then all the therapy in the world isn't going to take that away because it has to be dealt with spiritually. I can also tell you that when I was a kid going in elementary and junior high and senior high, I had never met somebody who was actually cutting themselves. But in the last couple of decades, this has become so, it's been an explosion in our society. So the question that we have to ask ourselves, what is the source? What is the source? Well, going on from there, in this warfare, um, in this warfare, Satan has a couple of goals. And the first goal, and you want to write this down, is to keep unbelievers blind spiritually. Blind spiritually. And it says, uh, the God of this world, this is from 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So here, he's called the God of this world, and then we began by looking at the verse that says that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So, so this is taking place. And notice it says he's blinded the minds. He's blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Part of what I do every week is I pray, God, you open the minds. It has to be his spirit opening the minds of understanding because whatever I do... Uh, it will have no effect if, if he's not opening the eyes. And so that's what I pray. And I would encourage you, when you pray for what God is doing here at this church, you pray that God opens the minds so that people can see. Would you do that? Good, good, good. All right, so that's for unbelievers. So if, if uh, he can't keep us from becoming believers, then the next thing that he wants to do is he wants to keep believers as ineffective as possible as ineffective as possible. Peter is writing to believers, and Peter says it like this. He says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So when it says that he prowls around like a roaring lion, one of the things about lions is they always wanna go after the easiest prey. They want to go after the, the one that strayed from the herd. They want to go for the one that's running the slowest, the, the one that they can catch the easiest. And uh, when it says, like a roaring lion, and uh, others take an, another view, and they'll say, when it says, like a, a lion, that Jesus in the Bible is also referred to as a lion, you'll hear it said, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. So so they say in, in this, you can take this, that this, what Satan is doing is he's trying to be like Jesus, like a roaring lion, in order to carry people off. And so, um, that, and that's certainly um, like trying to be like Jesus in a, in a way to, to deceive them. But then you notice it says to devour. He uses the word to devour. And that word devour there in the original, lang in the original language, catapino, just means to drink down or to gulp, to gulp. You ever seen somebody gulp something down? 
the idea when you're gulping something down, you want to swallow it as fast as you can. So he prowls around like a roaring lion. And then when he catches, his goal is to gulp them down as fast as he possibly can. And uh, so the goal then for the believer is to destroy our testimony. It would be to make us ineffective, or we might say fruitless in our walk with the Lord. So that's what he wants to do. That's part of what he, what he does. So to do that, what he does is he uses, and you want to write this down, he will use well-planned schemes, well-planned schemes. Verse 11, it says, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil, the schemes of the devil. Now, interesting, the word schemes there in the original language, I put it there in your outline, is the word methodia, methodia, from where we get the English word it's the next, it's right there, guys. It's right, it's, it's literally the next word, method. It's a, you can't miss it. I'll never set you up. So schemes, the word there in the original language is methodia from where we get the English word. Method. There you go, there you go. But what's interesting about that word is as you define it, notice how it takes that word method uh, by way of trickery, while or wiles, or to lie in wait, lie in wait. So what he does, these are not random plans that he uses. They're well thought out and it's, it's a scheme. It's well thought out, it's well planned. And so he takes the, 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 um, the cravings that we have, the temptations that we have, uh, the things that people say that argue against and we, we, you know, at the, we might not know the answer. And so he begins to do those, to use those things in order to pull us away and he's looking at our lives and he knows the right thing to pull us away. And he's been planning that. So we have to be on the alert. I've come to realize that as, as a dad, I've come to realize that part of Satan's schema, why he wants to destroy you and destroy me so much is, is that he knows that the only way that he can hurt God is to hurt what God loves the most. See, I, I, I've learned that if you hurt me, somebody hurts me, I'm fairly resilient. I just get back up, I keep going, I, I, just, I just go. Um, but if somebody hurts my kid, that's a pain I don't get over. Parents, would you agree with that? Somebody hurts your kid, it's, it's, you don't get over that. So the reason he wants to hurt you is he realizes that's really the only way that he can hurt God by hurting what God loves the most. So that's part, so he uses schemes to do that. So there's a couple of schemes that he uses, and we're gonna, we're gonna call these his favorite schemes. The favorite scheme is gonna be deception, deception. And uh, here, here's how he deceives us. The first one we're gonna talk about is false teaching, false teaching. Now, as we, we get into this, pay attention to the wording here. Paul is writing, and he says, now the spirit expressly says, it could say explicitly says, other translations, the idea is what I'm telling you, you can take to the bank. The Spirit expressly says that in latter times, if you have the King James or the Complete Word Study Bible, some they'll say the latter times, that means the last times, we would say the last days. It's just another way of saying the same thing. In the latter times, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits, there's that deception, and the doctrines of demons. Doctrine means teaching, the teachings that come from a demon. So the number one tactic that Satan uses is the, the, the whole uh, concept of deception. He wants to deceive us. When we take, after Easter, we're gonna take four weeks and we're gonna talk about end times prophecy. And what you find is that in Every passage that refers to the end times, the last days, the final generation, it will say deceived or deception. And Jesus talks about it. He says, see to that you're not deceived. Every time he talks about the end times, he talks about that because that's the theme of the last days. And he says, they will be giving heed to deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons in the latter times, we would say the last days. So what would be some of those teachings that would be part of the last days that were not part of the church for almost 2,000 years, but in that last generation, they would become very prevalent? Well, I, I would suggest the first one would be uh, 
that, that people would say that Satan doesn't really exist. He's more of a metaphor for, for evil, which is very prevalent. About 60% of people who profess to be Christians believe that. So would you agree that that would be a false teaching, a false doctrine? Absolutely. Um, what about this? You know, we're much more sophisticated today, so we don't really believe that God spoke the creation into existence. We actually believe that it came into existence through a whole other process. Well, that would be a deception in this generation, no other generation. If you take out the very first teaching of the Bible and you discredit that, then the rest of it begins to fall like dominoes. If you can't believe that, you can't believe the rest of it. And we did talk about that in our Genesis study. Here, here's one. Um, yes, Jesus is the way for us, but he's not really the way for everyone. You know, we have our truth and we're Christians, but you know, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one, no man comes to the Father but through me, he didn't mean everyone. He, he meant, you know, people like who Christians want, but other people, they have their truth, they have their faith, and it, it's really all the same. I mean, as long as you're sincere, that would be a false teaching, a false doctrine. You know, prayer isn't really something that changes anything, and so you should not really take the time to develop a prayer life. Pray before a meal, but don't really take time actually praying because the truth is it's not really going to change anything. After all, you have much more important things to do than to actually develop a prayer life. Do you know why most people who profess to be Christians never pray beyond a meal? It's because they've listened to a voice, a deceiving spirit, that says it really doesn't matter anyway. Would that make sense? So going on from that, those, the source of those teachings would not be from, from God. And Satan loves to find a Christian leader, Christian leader who will say things that the Bible says just the opposite. So um, some very prominent leaders in Christianity today are saying, you know, sex outside of marriage it's not really wrong, you know, it's, 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 you know it's, it's just a physical thing, it's not a spiritual thing. Um, I, I shared at the last uh, two services that when I was in college, I still remember the day, I went to a Christian college, and I was in human growth and development, and they brought in the dean of students, and he always came in and gave the sex talk to the, to the kids, to us. Um, and so he said, you know, it's okay to experiment sexually as long as you don't have intercourse because that's something that you want to save for marriage, but, but you, can, you can still do all those other things, which I can tell you that every 19-year-old kid wants to hear that. Um, but that destroyed many people's lives by listening to that. We looked in the last couple of weeks where Jesus talked about, or Paul talked about marriage, and we saw that in marriage, we're faithful to our spouse even before we meet them as we love them as Christ loved the church. Do you remember talking about that? So it's not experimenting around. That's not, you don't get that from the Bible. By the way, let me also say, the dean of students came in and really told us, told us that. When I graduated from college, the next year he was arrested and spent five years in a federal prison because while he was teaching us that, he was molesting children in his office. When they teach you something that the Bible doesn't say, always look, there's something else going on. So, and I saw that firsthand. You know, love is love. Love is love. And so if a man loves a man, um, shouldn't we just accept that? Because God is love and he loves us all. That would be true. But is love love or could that be a deception in order to pull people away? And many people believe in, in church world today that that is completely acceptable. The things that I've just shared are things that no one 50 years ago in church world believed. But in this last generation, these things, false teachings, doctrines of demons have exploded in church to where many people in church who profess to be Christians believe almost nothing of what the Bible actually teaches. You want to make sure that you believe in the Jesus of the Bible and the Bible. Well, 
Then another thing that we notice is that he uses temptations to catch me and publicly display me. Temptations to catch me and publicly display me. He uses temptations. He looks at the bents in our life, the things that, that we would gravitate towards. One of the things that I've always kept in my office is a fishing lure. Now, this is not the fishing lure I've had for years. We changed offices and mine got lost. But um, I, I wanted to just show you this lure. I don't know if you can see it. They're going to zoom in. But can you see the pretty red lips on this one here? I mean, it's, it's gorgeous. And can you see the big eyes? They're actually very big eyes. And wouldn't you agree that this lure is pretty in pink? It's pretty in pink. So here's what I want to do when I go fishing. When I go fishing, what I want to happen is I want the fish to see this lure, this bait, and I want the fish to think that is ultimate fulfillment. That's what I want. What I don't want the fish to do is I don't want the fish to see the hooks that are attached to it. Because if the fish sees the hooks, the fish will never take the bait. So what I want the fish to do is to see this as ultimate fulfillment. And so when the fish takes the lure, the bait, the fish won't know that it's actually been caught until I'm reeling it into the boat. And then once it's in the boat, then it knows it's been caught. And what do we do when we pull that fish in from the ocean and we pull it into the boat? What's the first thing that we do? We hold it up and we display it to anybody who's there to show what we've caught. Isn't that typically what we do? And that's what Satan does. He brings the right bait, wants us to think that it's the ultimate fulfillment, does not want us to see the hooks, reels us into the boat, and then he gladly holds us up for all to see and says, look, the Christian, the Christian took the bait, took the bait. And we all know many people who have taken some bait, don't we? We all do, we all do. So then what happens is once we take the bait, maybe we come back to the Lord and we repent. But then what Satan does, and you wanna write this down, he uses accusations against me to make me feel worthless. Accusations against me to make me feel worthless. It says, referring to Satan in that Revelation, it says, for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He accuses them before our God day and night. If he can keep us at the place where we perpetually, we don't receive his forgiveness, but we perpetually listen to his accus accusations. We feel worthless, unlovable, and uh, unusable. And that's where he wants us. That's, that's where he keeps us. So we'll talk about handling those accusations as, as we go forward. Another thing that he does is he uses deep hurts to make me bitter. Deep hurts to make me bitter. So Paul writing to Christians here says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it, it, many be defiled. When you meet a bitter Christian, it always, it always begins with somebody who got wounded somehow, some way. And instead of going to the Lord and saying, Lord, how do you want me to respond in this situation? How do you want me, to, what do you want to teach me? How do you want me to grow? They say, I am justified in my hurt. And when they do that, it turns into bitterness. And then bitterness begins to grow. And it's interesting, the last line there, it says, and by it many be defiled. It becomes an infection because they have to tell everybody they know about their hurt, and it begins to destroy other people. So Satan loves to use deep hurts in our lives to make us bitter. Well, um, next week, um, we're gonna answer the question, or begin answering the question, what do we do with all of this? And uh, so next week, we'll start talking, but let me just give you a couple of very, very quick things, and then we'll close. Um, we're gonna find that to fight effectively, I'm going to need to, you wanna write down, prepare, for the battle, stand firm and fight back, fight back. I put Ephesians 6, 13 on your outline and it says, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to, in, in this translation it says, withstand, and the word there is enthestomai, but I want you to underline the part where it says, 
histomai, histomai. It's the last part of the word, histomai, to withstand. In the evil day, having done all to stand, and the word stand there is the word histomai, histomai. So you have, some of your Bibles would say resist or to withstand. Uh, the word anthistomai takes the word histomai, which means to stand, and it adds the anthus to it. And so what that means there in your outline, to resist or, or to uh, withstand, means to stand against or to oppose. So the word anthistomai means that you're not just standing there taking a beating, but what's happening is when he takes the shot, you counter. And when you counter, it has an effect. So it's the return attack. It's fighting back. And we'll talk about that in the coming weeks where you hit back, you take the shot. The second thing I wanna say, if we're going to be effective in spiritual warfare, I have to decide that I'm all in. I'm all in. It says, having done everything to stand firm. Winning any war is never won by a casual commitment. Winning any war can sometimes take everything that you have. Winning the spiritual war will take everything that you have. And remember, you're going up against a, a demonic entity that doesn't even want you to believe that he exists. And so it, it wants you to fight the wrong, wrong battle. So next week, we will begin talking about how do we fight in the spiritual battle battle. And so let me just ask you a quick question. Did you find that at least interesting today? Good. Now, I said some things, and I might have offended some of you here today. I talked about, you know, Satan is real. You might be thinking, well, I don't know that that's really true, or that uh, God didn't speak the creation into existence. Ah, I'm more sophisticated than that now. When I said Jesus is the only way, you might be saying, well, I don't know that I fully embrace that. Or, you know, love is love, so shouldn't we just accept everybody and everything if they claim to be in love? Well, those things would not be from the Lord. Those would be doctrines of demons. It'd be a deceiving spirit that tells us those things. So here, here's what you need to hear from me as your pastor. You need to make sure that you are believing in the Jesus of the Bible. And the Jesus of the Bible is very different than the Jesus of our culture. The Jesus of our culture cannot save you. The Jesus of our culture is not true. Your faith needs to be in the Jesus of the Bible as, as revealed in the Bible. If you have placed your trust in what the Bible calls another Jesus. Again, let me say it, that Jesus cannot save you. And on that day, if you've placed your trust in the other Jesus, who might look, smell, taste, feel very much like the real Jesus, but he's not. The Jesus that you place your faith in, your trust in, is the Jesus in, of the Bible. You wanna make sure that you have not been deceived by the cultural Jesus because that can lead you to an eternally bad place. So I'm gonna close in prayer. And as I do, uh, you have the opportunity to come back possibly to the Jesus of the Bible, recognizing maybe you've bought into some deception or maybe for the first time realizing that you've been following a, a, uh, a very different Jesus than the Jesus of, of the Bible. And so with that, let's, let's pray. Father, as we, we come to a close today, we realize that your word says in the latter days, the last times, that people will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and literally the teaching or doctrines of demons. Lord, we live in the only generation in 2,000 years of church history where people embrace just about anything other than what you have laid out in your word and uh, at, at times thinking that, that that's what it means to be Christian. But Lord, as we've gone through this today, you've revealed some things. And I pray, Lord, that you have opened some eyes. And for those who, who've seen things differently a little bit today, uh, we now come back to the Lord, the Jesus of the Bible, as revealed in the Bible. And we say, Jesus, I want you, the Jesus of the Bible, 
the real Jesus, not the Jesus of deception, not the Jesus of my culture, but the Jesus who created everything by speaking it into existence. The only one who can actually save me and give me his Holy Spirit, which is real. And so we receive that Jesus right now and we thank you for forgiving us for the times where we looked to another Jesus or followed another Jesus and we wanna be part of your family, your fold and we ask you to reveal yourself to us as we go forward. Lord, thank you for this congregation. I pray that you keep each and every one of us till we meet again. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. One of the best things you can do when you come back to the Jesus of the Bible is participate in communion, recognizing that you're taking Jesus into the deepest part of you and giving him access to every part of you. God bless you.